Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for what I think is going to be a really fascinating uh, book discussion. Today, we have uh, Dr. Jade McGlynn, one of our newest senior associate non-resident fellows here at the Europe-Russia Eurasia program at CSIS. Uh, I should also say I'm Max Bergman. I'm the director of the Europe-Russia Eurasia program here at CIS, C CSIS. And Jade is the author of Russia's War, uh, a new book out now, or, or out on Tuesday, I guess, uh, so very soon here in the U.S., it's out already in the U.K., which explores domestic popular approval for Russia's ongoing aggression against Ukraine. I'm also going to be joined uh, by Maria Snegovaya, our senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia, and also Michael Kimmage, uh, another of our senior associates and also chair of the history department at Catholic University here in Washington, D.C., and it's uh, great that we have everyone here around the table and not on a not on a zoom screen uh, for this discussion but before we jump into Jade's book I just want to give uh, a little bit more background about about Jade and in her impressive biography uh, Jade is a research fellow in the war studies department at King's College London her first book was memory makers the politics of the past in Putin's Russia uh, also by uh, it was out by Bloomsbury Press but also out this year in 2023 she's one of the rare people that has two books out in one year congratulations uh, which details how the Russian state and society have used history to create a unifying national identity uh, in addition Jade has published two collected volumes and numerous peer-reviewed articles and chapters Jade's research has focused on Russia's war on Ukraine since 2014, Russian domestic media, Russian state society relations, and Russian and Ukrainian memory politics and soft power globally. Uh, she recently won a six-year award to investigate Russia's use of history in strategic communications toward Africa, China, Germany, and the Western Balkans. And prior to joining King's College London, Jade had held academic research appointments at Middlebury College, of Rosno State University and the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom. And she received her DPhil, uh, her PhD from the University of Oxford and worked as a lecturer in, Ru in Russian intellectual history and literature for two and a half years. Uh, so Jade, thank you so much uh, for being here. Why don't we just get right to it and start by, by talking about your book. And why don't you tell us uh, sort of why you started this project and maybe maybe some of the high points or, or main main themes that that come out uh, of this book and 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 frankly why is it called russia's war mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you i think it's a good i'll start with the final question mm -hmm. because i think it's probably the most relevant because people tend to think that this is a rejoinder to people who call it putin's war and that's not actually how it was intended um though i can see why it's interpreted that way it was more intended as a, an effort to try to explain how russians see the war and the different ways in which different russians see the war and um why to a certain extent why that is um and ultimately i mean this is what i hope well it's at least what i set about doing in the book whether or not i achieve it is of course an entirely debatable question but um i in the first part want to look at okay what narratives are russians um engaging with and in order to do that, there was sort of like a large scale telegram analysis where I also sort of coded for virality so I could see, you know, what was being shared the most. Um, and I looked at sort of a range of different sources, but also a range of different audiences. And one of the things that helped there is the fact that this is a topic that I've been studying, you know, since 2014. Um, and that in some ways I felt that even though in some ways, I felt that with memory makers, I maybe didn't finish the sentence of where my PhD research had taken me because I couldn't understand that it was always that question of, OK, but to what extent is this actually genuinely embedded? To what extent have, to use the Russian phrase, you know, some in the leadership sung themselves to sleep with their own lullabies? Mm -hmm. um, and clearly that, that answer came for us all um, on on the on the 24th of February. And I think that um, in particular, I felt like I had to write this book because I had already, I had a lot of the research there. I'd been having these conversations. I was still having these conversations about Russian identity, Russia's place in the world. And it almost, it very much felt like the sequel to a book that even at the time, I kept on trying to keep it into safe academic space, you know, with memory makers and Russia's war was, the time had come to sort of explain it. but. One in the second half of the book, I mean, in the first half of the book, I look at those narratives um, and I argue that, you know, it's not 
lots of people talk about sort of Russian support for the war, and I see it more really as, as of course, you have people who support the war, you have that section, you have people who oppose the war as well, of course. But I see it often as sort of more broadly like an acquiescence, an approval of the war, certainly an approval of maybe of the ends of the war, of controlling Ukraine, but not necessarily, there's certainly not that enthusiasm that you saw in 2014, um, you know, in terms of the real mobilization of people um, by the idea of, Crimea returning home, in, in their words, and um, of, you know, mobilizing as well to support the, the sort of freedom fighters, again, to use their words, um, in, in the Donbass. And so I wanted to look into that, and I wanted to look into the different ways that these different narratives resonate, and some of the reasons why. Um, and in, for part, in part, sometimes that's because, you know, these, this isn't about making people true believers necessarily. There's, of course, an aspect of that. And I think it's an aspect that's quite well covered, um, you know, outside of, of, of my analysis. But it's also about making people feel apathetic, about making people feel, OK, I don't know what's right or wrong, but I know that I'm Russian and Russia is under attack and therefore I'm going to stand with my people. And then, you know, you have your more general kind of, I suppose, plebiscitary approval. There's lots of different groups and they're not static either you know it goes in in different ways but ultimately my argument is that this is Russia's war because you this war began in 2014 there is a broad support for the ends of the war um, if even if we're not necessarily talking about the means and of course that's difficult anyway because we wouldn't be talking about the same images of the war and I look at why the, those reasons are and I sort of trace them in my mind to in, in my analysis and sort of based on my field work and, and, and the sort of ongoing interviews I've been doing since 2014 in basically in, in Russia's conceptions of itself. And, and that's why I think that this war is against Ukrainians. It's, um, it's obviously in Ukraine, but it can't be solved. Um, it can only be solved really by dealing with the fact of the way that Russia positions itself and, and understands itself, which I appreciate is a complicated thing to undo, but theoretically it's very possible. Nations are constructions. Putin is wrong. Nations mm -hmm. aren't essences. Mm -hmm. um, and nations do reconstruct themselves. Whether or not that's going to be an easy process, I think, is an entirely different question, but it at least leaves open a possibility, which was important to me because it was an incredibly depressing book to write um, and you know it's not a book that I wanted to write I think mm -hmm. we can put it that way maybe just to pick up on on mm -hmm. the depressing point and then we'll mm -hmm. bring mm -hmm. bring others uh, in as well you sort of close the book by saying uh, quote the Russian president can call off the quote special military operation but only Russians can stop the war mm -hmm. and I think part of the thrust of the book is that you seem quite pessimistic based off your analysis of uh, Russian outlooks and attitudes and, and how they've absorbed various narratives that the Russian, that the Russian public will call off the war. war. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe expand on, on that a mm -hmm. bit? Mm -hmm. um, this, the conclusion of the book takes you to kind of a very kind of pessimistic place about the the future of Russia is that correct? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd be very keen to hear from somebody who has an optimistic vision right now, to be honest. Um, but they're welcome to contact <laughs> me in any publicly available way. But um, in in a part, what I meant there as well was, uh, I suppose, I was appropriating the language of Russian television as well, in the sense and and Russian media more broadly, where you have this special military operation against Ukraine, but that is part of a wider war with the West. And that's really what I meant in the sense that in order to stop this positioning um, of Russia um, as, you know, I mean, and again, this draws on sort of older research is this idea that Russia has this unique understanding of its own history, it has some sort of unique access to historical truth. And it's, it's um, I suppose, mission, if you will, to defend that not only at home, but to help others restore their sort of one true self, their authenticity, you know, and against the to quote one Russian analyst, cultural weed mm -hmm. of America um, and the sort of general Western hegemony, um, that's really something that needs to be undone at a popular level as well. Of course, elites will do a very important role in shaping that. And to be honest with you, I'm not very convinced that Putin necessarily needs popular support anyway for the war. Um, but I mean, it's a nice to have, of mm -hmm. course, it makes things easier. Um, but I mean, that was one of the things sort of ending the book, I sort of thought, 
I need to ask myself some questions because I actually, you know, I mean, there's, Doesn't there's a matter. Yeah, exactly. And I, I actually don't think that it, it does matter that much in a decisive, in a decisive fashion. I suppose for me, I just thought that it was interesting because there's elements. I mean, if I go into sort of more of a think tank space, okay, well then why think about this? And I think the reason is because that we need to think about what happens after, after you know, after Putin, if we can dare ourselves to dream of such a time. And, um, you know, what is going to be, even if you had some miraculous and the statistics, you know, and it, I mean, I'm sure Maria could speak about this much better than I, I can, but, um, you know, the statistics for what happens after personalist autocracies fall apart are not promising ones. Mm -hmm. But let's say, you know, that there was this miraculous transition to democracy. If, if those are attitudes that are within society, then at some point you're going to need to appeal to those attitudes. And I think, you know, that's not something that's specific to Russia. We see that, you know, in, in across sort of other countries and I, that's another point that I suppose to come back to the essentialism is that I think that Russia is exceptional because it's extreme not because it's an exception mm -hmm. it's an extreme version for lots of different reasons including of course the nature of, of the autocratic regime currently in, 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 in the current iteration um, but it's um, there are things that we can also learn or perhaps warn, warn ourselves with from, from the Russian experience Right, it's it, the, the ingrained, or not ingrained, but the train. The Russian nationalism runs in, incredibly deep in the sense of Russian exceptionalism, and so even in a post-Putin Russia, that whether Russia would actually be quote unquote a normal country, I think that has bedeviled countries like the United Kingdom, like France, and other uh, former imperial countries as well. But, but Michael, um, Maria, I want to bring you both in, Michael, maybe start with you and then Maria on kind of your reaction to, to Jade's comments and to, to Jade's book and and are you also in sort of a, a, as pessimistic a place? Uh, thanks so much uh, Max for the conversation and of course Jade for the the book which is the reason for the conversation. Let me start far afield from the book itself. I think that if we take an analogy which is not an excellent analogy uh, of Hitler's Germany and related to Putin's Russia, you can go back in time and you wouldn't really need a book like Jade's for Hitler's Germany. In other words, to explain why the Second World War was popular in Germany, let's say from 1939 to 1941, from the invasion of Poland to Stalingrad, it's really not that complicated. Hitler was a soldier in the First World War. He sold himself as somebody who was going to avenge Germany's memory. Uh, he publishes Mein Kampf in the 1920s, which puts forward the notion of Lebensraum, uh, which he would then act upon uh, in his uh, in his strategies and in his actions uh, in the Second World War. And he mobilized and militarized German society thoroughly for six years before he waged the Second World War. So it's of course important that the war was popular in Nazi Germany, but it's not difficult to explain. I think if you fast forward to Putin's Russia, it's a lot harder to explain. Uh, it doesn't mean uh, that it can't be explained, and I think that the wonderful service that Jade's book does is to offer uh, an explanation, but, you know, there are differences, right? Putin sells himself at the beginning as a modernizer uh, of Russia, never without its thuggish element, never without its neo-imperial and national element or nationalist element that was always there uh, with Putin, but it's not uh, bloodthirsty at the beginning, or not especially so. Uh, there is, of course, a string of wars from the early 1990s through to, uh, to you know, 2008 in Georgia, 2014 uh, in Ukraine. That's not a secret, of course, uh, but these are not enormous galvanizing uh, wars. And I don't think that you can say that even on the eve of the invasion in 2022 that Russian society is deeply mobilized, militarized, yes, in many respects, but not in the way that uh, Nazi Germany was. And it's also difficult to say what the ideology is, you know, that was more coherent, I think, uh, in, in, in Nazi Germany. And in, in, in Putin's Russia, it's something more diffuse. Uh, and so in that sense, there's a felt need for readers, interpreters, policymakers to figure out why the war has been popular to the extent that it has been. And I fully agree with Jade that it's been popular as much as it's necessary to Putin for Putin to be popular. Uh, you know, I'll leave it to the social scientists to figure out exactly what the, uh, what the numbers are, but it's sort of popular enough to be uh, to be useful, and I would emphasize, especially in the book, the psychological points that are made. You can talk about the ideology and the sort of formal statements of the Kremlin with regard to the war, but I think that the uh, 
service of Jade's book is to understand how these are internalized. Sometimes, as she was suggesting a moment ago, with a certain amount of resistance. You have all these extraordinary quotes in the book from Fyodor Lukyanov, one of Russia's leading foreign policy experts, where it's clear he doesn't believe what the media says about the war. He doesn't really believe what the Kremlin says about the war, and yet he's not an opponent of the war. And so that kind of psychological gamesmanship is something that's there in some of the citations, but it's also there uh, in the analysis and the explanations of the book itself. And I've not seen that elsewhere, and I think it's just, you know, sort of something completely remarkable. And the final point I'll make very briefly is that uh, I, I fully agree. Uh, one would wish to be optimistic. I think you need to always be alert to possible contingencies. Uh, and, you know, I'll have a question later for Jade about Russia as a dictatorship and how that modifies the argument. And if you would take the dictatorship out of the equation, it's hard to predict what would come in Russia. But the residue of this kind of imperialism, nationalism, anti-Ukrainianism is very great. But I would worry most in a way about the residue of some of the psychological dynamics that are described of kind of rationalizing mm -hmm. uh, things that are unethical, rationalizing things that are ultimately bad for Russia mm -hmm. itself, which is what I believe the war uh, to be. How do you escape from that? And the longer the war lasts, the longer you have this climate of, of, of how does one describe a climate of confusion or a climate of, of obfuscation, the harder it's going to be to uh, escape from it. It is escapable, uh, but we do have to factor in its, its potential longevity. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so as other uh, speakers said, it's really ha hard to have a debate here mm -hmm. since a lot of the book really preaches to the choir are here. I actually wanted to congratulate Jade uh, from, from where I'm coming from for, as I said, being quite unforgiving uh, to the Russian society, even if you're emphasizing the, the need for, for empathy, and I agree. Uh, having said that, I think it's important to stop hiding behind all this, you know, um, wills of uh, Russians not really supporting this war, the polls lying, and essentially everything being extremely complicated and impossible to understand, which is ironically the same frame that both the Kremlin and the Russian liberals uh, use, the Kremlin propaganda uh, and uh, many liberal groups in the Russian society. Uh, so, first of all, um, I paid particular attention to your second chapter since I work with the public opinion, and I think you did a great job sort of uh, debunking many of the myths uh, that have to do with the Russian opinion polls, right? I'll just quickly sum them up for the, for the audiences here. So, these common arguments that uh, the polls are not trustworthy, that Russians, uh, the, the high, the, there's high levels of non-response rates that prevent us from understanding uh, what's going on. Jade argues that even if there is a little bit of a decline in the response rates, which, by the way, my Levada friends don't even confirm in the first place, mm -hmm. uh, those probably refl uh, reflect the opinions of no more than 10% of the society or something along those lines, right? So even if some increased number of Russians are refusing to respond or are reluctant to respond, it's still a margin uh, of the society. Uh, second of all, uh, it's also the polls are also very, the response rates are actually quite comparable to the ones we see in the West. Uh, there's a um, dynamic of this war and the public acquiescence uh, or rallying around it is very similar to what we've seen. In the previous wars, it's not unlike, um, in that sense, it's not unusual. Are the are the indicators of public approval, such as I know societal well-being, optimism, also are reflective of that same dynamic? So if they say uh, if they are not done the line about the attitudes towards the war, then why do we see uh, them also lying about everything else? Um, so the question here that I'm more puzzled with, right, is why there's such a drive on the side of many of our liberal friends from Russia to make this explicit that Russians do not support this war and we have no way to know it. As one that some sort of defense psychological mechanism might be interested in your opinion uh, on it. Second, um, and that goes to Michael's point, I think, uh, and that your book also shows that quite nicely, I, I believe, the comparisons between uh, the Nazi Germany and Russia, they are really also perhaps misguided. Uh, these are just very different societies for all the reasons that Michael pointed out. On top of everything else, I think your book also shows that Russian society is in a lot of ways traditionalist, right? You have the state on top and a lot of people who just acquiesce, right? They just by default pretty much accept anything that the state does and then they use propaganda to rationalize as to why. Mm -hmm. And the propaganda just throws at them all these various narratives about Nazism, 
sa Satanism, you name it, <laughs> mm -hmm. in Ukraine, and they just pick the whatever it is fits them based on their personal preferences and all the psychological needs that you pointed out, mm -hmm. right? So they actually agree by default mm -hmm. with pretty much anything. Unfortunately for us, the, nukes, the nuclear option included. And the recent polls have shown that you already have at least 30% of the Russians uh, accepting, willing to accept the Kremlin using the nukes. That's before propaganda actually picked up that narrative and started convincing them that NATO is about to use it, so we absolutely need to act first. Um, having said that, the question again goes back to that, uh, the way we started, right? From my perspective, where I'm coming from, the, in the Nazi Germany, public opinion mattered to the extent that the society was really mobilized. It was a civil society, but the civil society on steroids, very polarized. Sherry Berman, uh, my former advisor at Columbia, actually shows it really nicely. In the Russian case, we have this really, I mean, as you say, right, not even um, society in the sense that this, in terms of social relationships and solidarity. It's a population. Right, that's willing by default is non significant, not insignificant, share, insignificant shares of it, uh, by default accepting everything that the Kremlin does. And that's why uh, the foreign policy in Russia is so discretionary, so dependent on one individual leader, because there's no constraints imposed on the society. From that perspective, yes, going back to where Max started, does it really even matter what people think, mm -hmm. given that everything ends up depending on one political leader? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Those are some great questions. Yeah, um, uh, let me start with the first one, um, which related to the sort of why there's this um, insistence or, you know, this constant, I suppose, need um, among, or it can, what can feel like a constant insistence or need um, among certain sections of the Many Russian of them are friends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I had need to, exactly, many of them are my friends. We don't talk about my book. Um, <laughs> we talk about other things. Um, and I think, in part, look, it's an emotional response. Everything, you know, this is a very emotional topic and that's completely understandable. I think it's also a reaction against, um, you know, people trying to apply this sense of collective guilt in particular, um, which is, of course, unfair because, you know, each individual is ultimately guilty for their own individual actions. Um, I think there's also a pushback against any idea of collective responsibility, um, which I can also understand, especially in light of the point you were just making in terms of society as such, not really mm -hmm. actually being there you know it's a very atomized society and also because it must be incredibly annoying for some people including you know again some of your friends I'm sure and some of my friends who really have put themselves in danger to protest Putin to protest different things who went on the march of peace you know in 2014 whilst you know certain western politicians who now are sort of more Ukrainian than the Ukrainians you mm -hmm. know were very happy to take money and you know to house the families of those elites so I think that hypocrisy um, again, something that also <laughs> sticks in the throat of um, the other side, but also sticks in the throat, I think, of a lot of reasonable people. I think that is one of the reasons for, for the reaction. Um, and I, I have sympathy. I have a lot of sympathy on that side. Where I have less sympathy is, I think, um, when it blurs into a dismissiveness towards Ukrainian suffering. And that's what I think, um, that's what I find, I think, most troubling. Um, and may I jump in by quoting do. from your book where you say, right, that actually something striking, but you, I think, kind of, I, when I read it, I realized you, you had a point that uh, Ukrainians and their sufferings and the agency doesn't even feature in a lot of conversation on uh, liberal Russian telegram channels, right? And absolutely true, right? The war just happened. And uh, whatever's happening there, it's very unfortunate, but there's no specific reference very mm -hmm. often to Ukrainians and the pain they're going through. Mm -hmm. I actually noticed that too. And uh, very often what I also noticed is when you start the conversation and you have this line about Russians not supporting this war, Poles are lying, uh, the counter argument would go, um, uh, you, you then ask them, okay, but who is committing all these atrocities on the ground in Ukraine? And usually the interesting thing, there's no response. It's just they just switch the theme. They, they probably mm. have nothing to respond to that. Mm. It's interesting. Sometimes I, I do get a response, and that response also makes me sad because it's often something quite dismissive. You know, oh, it's people who don't have any education, or it's people who, um, you know, are sort of like Soviet mindset, these sorts of things, you know, and it goes back into that 
very unpleasant binary of okay you have enlightened Russians and then you have and this is the phrase of, of a Russian this is not my phrase but um, you know a sort of slave mentality Russians and so us I, versus them in some ways yes exactly and uh, I mean Russia is not the only country with those binaries it to be honest with you I mean not in any way to relativize but it very much does you know make me think of some of the discussions around Brexit in the UK um, between you know particularly towards people who, who voted for Brexit, this kind of refusal to acknowledge that they might have a legitimate view. You don't have to agree with it. You can be deeply unsympathetic to it, but at least to try to understand where it came from rather than just say they're idiots or, you know, they're brainwashed or, you know, these sorts of things. And I think that's that's a process that is happening. I'm, I'm, perhaps people could draw analogies with the US context by... I'll leave that to Americans. <laughs> but, you know, and it's it's such a shame because ultimately, you know... For, for all of those groups, they need to be able to, to understand, you know, you, it's not good for democracy in any future if you just don't acknowledge the other sides. Yet another view. thing that's not good in, for democracy in, in Russia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a long list. <laughs> but the question about, uh, does it really matter? Oh, I don't think it does, if I'm honest with you. Um, I think it makes it a lot easier. Um, and definitely, I mean, you know, it's a lot easier to be, I mean, this is not my line, I'm stealing it from, from Tim Fry, but, um, you know, it's much easier to be a popular autocrat or a popular dictator even now um, than, than it is to be an unpopular one. It's also a lot cheaper, but um, it's not, I don't think that it is necessary. I think the reason why I find it, I mean, well, first of all, it's just always been my research area, so that's why I like writing about it, but, or, or intellectually like writing about it, um, but, I think it's important for us to understand in terms of what comes after, um, you know, if you know, once once there is no Putin for whatever happens, um, because those attitudes they're based on real things and sometimes very justifiable grievances. You know, there was there was a resonance there, and the way it's been kind of manipulated and turned off into this, of course, it's become something incredibly gruesome and horrific. But you need to deal with with the grievance that's there even if right now it's in a completely unjustifiable form, it, or at least it needs to be recognized, it needs to be recognized, and a narrative needs to, you can't just impose a narrative on people because narratives are about making meaning, and you know it needs to in some way resonate with, with people's lives, and that's also the weakness, actually, that, that Max and I were discussing earlier about, as increasingly, you know, because this, a lot, this research was, a lot of it was done in the first six months of the war, increasingly, as you know, the rhetoric and the reality of what the outcomes are for the Russian army um, in Ukraine, i.e. not especially um, successful from their point of view, that's of course going to continue to puncture that resonance that, that propaganda depends on. The platform isn't enough. Can I, can I just push you maybe a little mm -hmm. bit on um, public opinion not mattering mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For, for the Kremlin? Because, you know, I, I think in at least in the context of this war, I think we've seen it matter mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, the the you know, there was a fear back at basically this time a year ago that Putin was going to announce a mass mobilization because the Russian military wasn't really prepared for the war that they found themselves in. Mm -hmm. He delayed. It didn't happen until September. Mm -hmm. The mobilization didn't really hit, you know, get to the battlefield until the winter. Mm -hmm. uh, and now there's talk of him potentially needing to do another round of mobilization. But what would be the real constraint? Well, you're starting to decrease some of the resilience mm -hmm. of the regime. And so I... I, I wonder maybe if you could respond to that. I'm mm -hmm, mm -hmm. curious for Michael's opinion as well about, because it does strike me there is probably this underlying nervousness mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that about needing to keep the population on side, committed, and that it could go the other way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, I think what I meant by doesn't matter is the sense that it doesn't matter as in that's not the decisive factor of whether or not the war will end. Mm -hmm. I think it clearly public opinion does matter to the Kremlin. We know that they kind of have their polling, you know, their public polling. It matters in that sense that they care about it and they pay attention to it certainly. So I think that's a good point and a, a, an important clarification. Um, you're right in terms of the mobilization and we see even though it would on a, I mean okay I'm not a military strategist but I don't think you have to be to understand that clearly Russia you know in another situation would mobilize more men and there's been that reluctance to do so you know all of these efforts to try and find you know any other way to, to sort of get men because as you saw with the sort of mobilization wave um, that happened in September not only was it in many cases 
sort of unpopular, um, but it was the first time that we saw this, you know, marked decrease again in the polls in terms of sort of support or willingness to go along with um, the war. And that makes sense because you spend 22 years telling people you stay out of politics and I'll do X, Y, Z, and that's the deal. It's very hard to then say to them, okay, now you need to mobilize um, for a war that I think most Russians understand is not the great patriotic war. Um, you know, they haven't been invaded. Um, and you know, they're in, maybe they think that those lands should be Russian, but I think they understand that they are not Russian if we perhaps leave Crimea out of the equation. Um, so it's very hard to then, you know, to then, um, to ask people to genuinely turn this into an existential struggle when it seems to me that whilst the Kremlin or, you know, Putin seems to, and maybe the Siloviki see it as an existential struggle, and it may well end up being an existential struggle for them, time will tell. I don't, it clearly isn't one for, for Russia as a nation, or it certainly doesn't have to be. And I don't think, certainly last year, that it was as viewed as such. And I don't think it is this year, even though I haven't done quite the same level of media analysis to accompany the, the sort of continuing conversations or interviews that I have. My thoughts. Yeah, there's, there's one group, uh, I think, where public m opinion matters a lot, and that's the soldiers mm. themselves. And I think a recent trend of the last couple of weeks, really, very modestly in tension with some of the theses of this uh, book is a widening space between the official narrative of the war and the actualities of the war as it is experienced on the front. And the figure who's trying to fill that space or take advantage of that space is clearly Prigozhin with these perplexing YouTube um, YouTube speeches, which are really the, some of the first prominent, honest discussions of the war that I've seen uh, on the Russian side from somebody who's again perplexingly sort of within uh, the regime, but I think Prigozhin senses an opportunity there that you can hide the reality of the war from the population for sure, or you can manipulate that population into either supporting or not opposing it. The soldiers themselves are going to have a different take, uh, and that's uh, uh, if I were uh, advising Putin in the Kremlin, I think that that would be a very, very acute point of anxiety uh, or concern. But uh, let me ask uh, a question from the stereotypical Russian liberal who's not at the table just so that mm -hmm. uh, we do our due diligence in mm -hmm, terms of mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. point of view. And I'll just do my best with it. It's not my own uh, perspective, but I'll just sort of ask the question as best I can. And I think we'll return here to this idea of Russia as a, as a dictatorship. And mm -hmm. what dictatorships do, and I think Hannah Arendt described this best of all in her great book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, is that they manufacture falsehood. Mm -hmm. And falsehoods become a way of proving your loyalty to the regime. And the falsehoods are also useful because they allow you to manipulate certain realities. Uh, and, you know, of course, Goebbels would be the example of that uh, in the 1930s. And you sort of have Solovyov and Kislyov and others who perform something of that function uh, for, uh, for Putin's Russia. But uh, the question is, what happens if the conditions of dictatorship uh, are not there? And you could take the example of the Afghan war in, say, 1987, 1988, Mm -hmm. It had become quite unpopular. It wasn't really possible to say so. There still wasn't electoral politics. I mean, I guess Glasnost opened certain opportunities. There wasn't an anti-war movement. But what was realized, I think, after the fact is that that unpopularity of the Afghanistan war really contributed to protest movements in mm -hmm. Lithuania, mm -hmm. elsewhere within the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. But that was only visible after the fact. And when you took the dictatorship out, you have a very different conversation in all those parts of the former Soviet Union about the war and what the war in Afghanistan was. Is that... Mm -hmm. maybe remotely possible under these circumstances, mm -hmm. that if this underpinning of dictatorship is removed, something mm -hmm. else and quite different would take its place. I think it's definitely a possibility. And I mean, the point of the book is not to argue that Russians support the war, because I want to make some kind of point. My point is to ask, what does it mean if we say Russians support the war? Um, and yes, I agree with you, of course. I think that um, I take your points around sort of dictatorship. I think it takes time as well for wars to become unpopular. That's the other aspect. But I think, I suppose, to come back to it, I mean, the Afghanistan war is quite a difficult one to compare, I think, um, with with Ukraine. And, and that almost then takes me back to this thesis, which, of course, is then informed by my own research into the sort of the way that sort of there's been this post-Soviet identity construction within Russia and um, the sense of belonging to a group. And I think that, you know, for many Russians, I think it's Ira, who is a liberal Russian, who does still speak to me. Um, 
um, in the book. Um, and she says it beautifully because she says, you know, there aren't that many groups that were available to Russians, you know, to, to Russians maybe living, you know, in, you know, smaller cities to belong to. And the state came and it gave them a group and it gave them a reason to feel proud of that group. And I think that's an issue. That's an entirely human need, the need to belong to a group and to feel good about your group. But what worries me is at the moment, I don't see any alternative narrative for that for that group for, for the kind of you know Russian people and that's one of the things that really worries me about when I hear the sort of Russian opposition I have to say that I think Navalny did cut through a lot more than some others you know in terms of getting to those people um, but um, with, with with that exception of course given Navalny's current awful predicament there are other issues there to, to consider but that sense that nobody's really coming up with a narrative that actually could encompass like a different vision of Russianness, of what Russia could be and what its place could be in the world. And I'm not saying it would be perfect, but that that I think is a kind of prerequisite. And that's, I think, ultimately what makes me very depressed about it all. I do want to come back, though, if it's okay, to just to yes. the point about Prigozhin, because um, I sort of understand, or I put it out in the book, you know, that I understand it almost as like a spectrum. So you have your active opposition, you have your, you know, who are against the war, the state tries to make them apathetic, has apathetic people, it tries to make sort of my country right or wrong, neutral loyals. Those people it tries to make supporters, but in a kind of restrained sense in that they don't get too many of their own ideas. But then you have your active supporters, as opposed to the leadership critical active opposition, they are policy critical. And that's a good thing. It can function almost like a pseudo-democratic institution in many ways, and indeed on Telegram I think does, because there's a relative lack of what you know that you can read other channels you can read like um, opposition channels and, and whatnot on telegram um, and it's there and it's helpful because it allows the Kremlin to understand you know what is going on what are people kind of complaining about and every now and again clearly the military bloggers go too far and you see this sort of little crackdown but it's useful to to the Kremlin but one of the things that I'm finding interesting now is whether or not this is a spectrum or actually a horseshoe <laughs> and I guess it depends on how many more references we get to the happy grandfather you know um, and and the other well less pleasant words that were used um, by Brigosian you know because does how does that step go from policy critical but ultimately you know it's just because people it's like Shaigu or it's whoever's fault that they're not kind of you know it's not Putin's fault when is that bridge made because that's a completely different situation than I think the one we've been in so far in terms of the military bloggers and yeah I think maybe just on that point um it, it does strike me that one of the one of the, the dangers right now for the Kremlin, and maybe to just be the put some put an optimistic hat on <laughs> for a second, is that there's a growing divorce or disconnect between the narrative and the reality on the ground. And I think one of the interesting things about Bergosian is suddenly you see this sort of explanation for why they're losing the war, right, or why things aren't going well, but that the narrative. Uh, that Putin has has created, that has pushed. Now, some of these narratives go to help explain why things aren't going well. This is NATO's fault. Mm -hmm. But when that, it, you know, what what we saw in Afghanistan was that no one, it, it, Afghanistan in the 1980s, is that by the end of the Soviet Union, no one sort of believed in it. It was clear that there was sort of this hollowing out. No one bought into the narrative. And so if, I guess one of the questions is that whether there's a, a, a real danger for the Kremlin where the, the nationalist uh, narrative about rallying around this war effort that now clearly uh, clearly isn't going well, or at the very least that it, should Ukraine make battlefield, more battlefield advances, have a successful counteroffensive, if Crimea is being bombarded, does suddenly the whole narrative of Putin and the legitimacy of Putin of being this sort of leader that brought economic prosperity, mm -hmm. stability, Russia being respected in the world, all that sort of now goes away. Uh, and while there's a counter narrative that are being pushed, it really runs uh, into the reality that you know Russians are seeing where there's casualties, people have fled, th and, and that the economic situation is poor. Is that, I think, a, a, a potential, you know, uh, some green shoot of optimism that maybe we could see that the, the narratives are being undercut by the reality of what's happening both in the war and on the ground in Russia. And I'm curious for both your mm -hmm. thoughts. Yeah, I want to hear Maria's thoughts yeah, yeah. as well. Um, so 
I'm not sure why it would necessarily be a green shoot of optimism. I think it's definitely a possibility, mm -hmm. but if the problem is <laughs> that it undermines Putin's legitimacy um, among the population because he hasn't achieved his goals in Ukraine, that doesn't necessarily mean it's undermined like the ultimate ends. Okay. Um, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, I guess it depends why. Mm -hmm. Depends why. Are people angry? because the war was launched and I mean that doesn't have to mean because the war was launched against Ukrainians because bluntly a lot of nations are selfish and you know not everybody always focuses on the suffering of others that's not that's not unique to Russia but is that the problem or is the problem that he failed to achieve these objectives that people find interesting and I don't know the answer to that because as well we're pretty deep in hypothetical territory yeah. but I think that that answers an important one especially in terms of who where the appetite is for who comes next, because in particular, I mean, we talk about Putin as a nationalist, and of course, I, uh, you know, I understand what you mean, but actually he's very careful. I mean, he definitely plays with and flirts with ethno-nationalism, mm -hmm. particularly in 2014 and some of the, the narratives, but actually he's very careful to build an idea of kind of Ruski or like, you know, ethnic Russian as denoting like the culture established by ethnic Russians so that it is still kind of inclusive um, in, to a certain extent. I mean, though Russians are clearly kind of first amongst equals mm -hmm. and um, I think that what I worry about is whether or not you know as in the 2000s like the main um, there's a sort of I don't mean like a neo-nazi nationalist but you know so, um, considerably softer than that but ultimately like a nationalist you know we're done with feeding the caucuses this sort of these sorts of narratives come to the fore because again people need to belong to a group and they need to feel good about that group and it's going to be really hard to feel good about being Russian you know in for many ordinary Russians and they're going to look and you know a lot of these nationalist groups they're doing interesting work and quite a few of them are not for the war They've spoken against the war in the sense that they say it's it's weakening Russia, so it's not a good thing. Um, but we're going to stay and we're going to help citizens in Mariupol, you know, giving out blankets, or we're going to stay and we're going to help, um, you know, to deliver medicine to soldiers. And I, I mean, I I don't know. Again, we're really in hypothetical territory, but it seems to me that that would be, um, if we think about this point where people are like, oh, this war was, you know, a bad idea. That's I could see that narrative appealing much more than um, than some of the other ones that are on offer. Yeah, this is actually the one area where I do not uh, fully agree, uh, Jade. I actually think that um, this Russians do not necessarily support the end in this war. To me, it's more of that same acquiescence where they accept mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whatever they've been told. And frankly, we've seen it. I personally was shocked. Again, uh, mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. arguing that my uh, 10,000 followers on Facebook or, or Telegram anyhow representative. I think if anything, that <laughs> not representative because they're my followers, the best uh, of they're the, the best. Russian society. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> so, um, uh, but uh, what was striking after, uh, as a result of the failure of the Blitzkrieg, Originally, mm -hmm. uh, the Russian uh, Putin had to re uh, re um, uh, locate the troops. Um, I posted something along those same lines that this is definitely a failure on the side of Putin's operation, and uh, got some responses that was saying, "Hey, why are you saying this is a failure? It's consistent entirely with the original goal of denazifying Ukraine." So they came, they denazified the Kiev and Chernihiv region, and now they're pulling away because Russians are not invaders; they're just on the mission here, right? Now, now they re really locating to different area where they're going to again apparently do whatever it is mm -hmm. which is ob obviously completely opposite of how the Kremlin at first presented this war mm -hmm. but apparently two weeks or like a month later that was already acceptable is another propaganda narrative mm -hmm. again to rationalize whatever it is was happening from that perspective I mean it's horrible of course that mm -hmm. this is this absolutely lack of any critical reflection of what's going on but in the sense this is where I'm with Max mm -hmm. uh, I think it actually leaves us hope that uh, under different different leadership, especially in the context of fatigue and uh, perhaps uh, economic decline unraveling, uh, this it will be very easy to this, again, acquiescent Russian majority to accept any uh, narrative as a well-justified end of this war, even if it me means essentially abandoning uh, the regions that Russia occupied. You can just tell them, hey, you, did, uh, you achieved your mission, now time to go back, essentially as originally planned. I agree. I think probably I should be clarify what I mean. So the ends of the war, in my mind, and this is more of a reflection, and there's no reason you would know this because you don't live in my mind, <laughs> and I should have explained it, um, is I understand that ultimately the war is about controlling Ukraine and that that's what it's always been about. It's the, the you know, not necessarily maybe all of Ukraine. I'm sure they'd allow Lviv um, 
to, to go. But the idea that, you know, Russia has a right to control Ukraine doesn't necessarily have to be in the same way as this, you know, the, the sort of the ghastliest part of this war, i.e. since the, the full scale invasion. But, you know, and they've tried different ways. And um, but this is what it comes down to for me in terms of what I see. And mm -hmm. I think that that is something that does resonate whether or not, you yeah. know, and that's what I mean is the means. What's the Bureau syndrome? Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, it's not that's not the only country on the periphery of Europe working on its post imperial identity. <laughs> But um, <laughs> so that's kind of that was more what I meant is that you'll still have that and that if th that's still I mean, that doesn't mean that it, that it will necessarily be a big risk. It depends on whether or not people engage it. And again, I think that's something that we see in other societies. Sometimes there are certain kind of cultural elements or implants that are there. And if you don't wake them up, they're kind of just there and, and they can remain rather mm -hmm. marginal. Yeah, asleep. But if you wake them up. And then if you kind of egg them we'll on. We see what happens. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, this is where I'm not with Max uh, on the <laughs> no. long-term <laughs> optimism, right? We see a very dramatic self-selection going on, right? All the more pro-liberal, pro-Western anti-war groups are fleeing uh, the country or they're being repressed. And as in, in contrast, the remaining groups of the population that are being drugged on this uh, propaganda, uh, and we see that the education in the um, in the schools and the universities that promotes uh, the mm -hmm. same ideology, mm -hmm. there's some warning signs emerging uh, recently that even the younger generation, which used to be some of the most pro-liberal, pro-Western groups, now actually is quite malleable mm -hmm. to this pro-war narratives. And so, in a couple of years of that same dynamic, um, we are likely to face a very different uh, Russia emerging perhaps no longer acquiescing, but actually quite willingly embracing some of these narratives uh, more than they, uh, they've they been doing before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's my greatest fear. But on, but on that, and then uh, bringing Michael on this, I mean, are we also just seeing potentially, a, a, I mean, a, a, a kind of a rally around the flag effect that happens when a country goes to war where you have neighbors and, and other people that you know that are off fighting in Ukraine and they're good good people and so you're mm -hmm. you know in favor of my the country war right or wrong. yeah my country right or wrong and you know I think the United States has some experience mm -hmm. with with this and uh, you know, we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier that our, our opinion for the war in Iraq was boards of 80% mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you know I think five years later it was almost reversed mm -hmm. and and but no one would ever admit to sort mm -hmm. of supporting the war the people who had switched um, and mm -hmm. so there, I think, you know, public opinion sometimes can be malleable. I know, mm -hmm. Michael, I'm curious for, sure. for, for your reaction there. Let me make the point in the form of a question to Jade. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are two ways of interpreting the 2022 war. And I think historians will be arguing this debate for a very long time to come. And the first is as an inevitability. <laughs> and, you know, that this is, in effect, how Russia sees the region. Uh, it uh, has always conducted itself as such. And the problem of Russia in the 1990s and sort of until maybe 2014 or 2020, 2022, is it just didn't have the capacity in its eyes to realize its ambitions. But when, it, when that capacity was there, the decision was made to do what it did in 2022. And so when that capacity returns, if it's been degraded, that same problem is going gonna, is gonna to be there. I'm exaggerating for the point mm -hmm. of, 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 of comparison. The other line of argument would be that the 2022 war is an accident that, uh, you know, you had decent relations between Russia and Ukraine in the 1990s. Obviously, Yeltsin, if you sort of look under the cover, you can find attitudes there that are not especially cosmopolitan uh, or liberal, but still you have that treaty of friendship in 1997 between Russia and Ukraine and certainly a kind of functional relationship. With Putin, things got difficult sort of faster, uh, but uh, it's not as if the relationship was completely pathological uh, until 2013, and of course, when Putin has Yanukovych, it makes things uh, easier. But Medvedev in Ukraine is not a horror story. It's, it's uh, mm -hmm. you know, a story with multiple uh, possible outcomes. Uh, and the final sort of data point that you could use to argue for the 2022 war as an accident uh, of Russian history or Russian political culture is that almost nobody in Russia believed it was going to happen on the 23rd of February 2022, including a lot of the people that you interview in the book. I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about Trenin. Maybe he did mm -hmm. think it was going to happen, but I know that Lukana, mm -hmm. Lukana mm -hmm. thought it was not going to mm -hmm. uh, happen, although he's, you know, danced acrobatics to justify it uh, ever since, which is, of course, the, you know, the theme of your book, and it, that's, that's beautifully explained. But I'm very curious to get a sense of how you think about that. How would you weigh the sort of two different readings, the inevitability versus the accidental reading of what happens in 2022? 
because that does matter in terms mm -hmm. of what's going to come next. Mm -hmm. The more it's an accident, the more it's possible that perhaps Russians could change gears. Mm -hmm. If it was inevitable, mm -hmm. then uh, there's no hope at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think, obviously, if I appreciate you are deliberately kind of exaggerating. So I think there are elements of both. But the problem is, of course, there's certain elements of accident because, well, it's not even accident, though. It's a refusal to acknowledge Ukrainianness. They just they just didn't properly research Ukrainian society. There's this attitude of like, you know, sort of like what Ukraine? Oh, yeah, you know, oh, cool, like Andrusha, you know, all of this sort of attitude. And I think, and I think, s sadly, that sometimes is also mirrored in Western analysis as well, like this um, misunderstanding of, of what Ukrainians are going to do, because um, well, I hope it won't get me in trouble next time in Kiev, but I didn't think that Zelensky would stay, um, you know, because that's it's a pretty frightening thing. It's a very heroic thing very that he did. Heroic. I don't think the United States thought he should stay. <laughs> no, no, they didn't. I don't <laughs> think London did either. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but he did. But I, I always kind of understood because I spent a lot of time in Ukraine sort of you know since 2012 and obviously it was changing that Ukrainians would fight a, a, you know a pretty insistent insurrection I just didn't imagine they would get all of the support and obviously that was the thing that Zelensky did by staying is he kind of enabled that to, to be sort of a state part but we're getting sort of a bit further away but so in terms of accident no I don't think it's an accident I think in a way maybe it's a feature of the of the system um, both of the imperialist mindset, but also, of course, of the corruption. And that's why you have all of these hilarious Ukrainian memes about, like, you know, their main ally being Russian corruption, <laughs> because it kind yeah. of is. And I think then that also leads us back to some of the discussions, you know, and there have been some heated debates about whether or not it's actually helpful for the Anti-Corruption Foundation right now to be doing, you know, exposés of corruption Especially within the defense industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> like, no, leave them to it. Yeah. To encourage corruption in <laughs> Russia. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think I answered your question, because I I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I have. Let, a me, let me test it in just one uh, one additional mm -hmm. way um, with a hypothetical, mm -hmm. uh, which at least haunts me. Not that I myself have any idea what the true answer is to this question. Mm -hmm. But had Russians been polled on the 23rd of February, 2022, had they been able to, you know, sort of vote for their leaders and make decisions from the ground up? I don't. Th or w do you think that the war? would have happened. My hunch is that it wouldn't have. I, my hunch is that it just wouldn't... You mean the big full-scale war? Right. It's not something that Russians wanted no, before no, the, day, the day before it there's happened. There's no evidence no, for that. Yeah, uh, for sure. In mm -hmm. which case, okay. I think it would sort of support the more accidental reading uh, of it. If there isn't a kind of big popular base of legitimacy for the decision itself, um, that has well, to sort of shape the way that we read the origins but of the war and the, and the lead up to it. But well, the origins begin in 2014 when there is a lot of legitimacy yeah, for, for it. Sure. So I think, again, it's about, like, this is one of the things that I worry about, especially when it comes to ending the war, is if we just think about it after 2022, of course there are clear differences. And, of course, Putin is basically the catalyst for the invasion. I don't think it's definitely Putin's invasion. You know, there's, there's no real discussion to be had there. Mm. But, you know, it then leads us into... I guess, I mean, I find it kind of surprising, I suppose, that you still have these discussions about, like, oh, could we do this, could we do that? And you think, well, okay, but the war started in 2014 and we, di we tried all of those things and we ended up here. So, you know, we can't do that again. We can't try these sort of, you know, Minsk free style approaches or, oh, if we could just do this. And I know nobody at this table is suggesting it, but this is still something that is part of the wider, including policy making discourse, I think, including mm. in Europe um, and, and possibly here. I, I don't know enough um, here. And, uh, I think what worries me is if we separate it too much, the 2022 big war or the full-scale invasion, from the the rest of the, you know, from the 2014, that we then lose some of that hinterland, that context that is necessary to, to think through policy. Well, let me take Michael's question mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. project it forward, because mm -hmm. I think it's not only a relevant question to, you know, from a historian's perspective to look at, you know, well, what was the, what was the cause of the war in 2022, but it, it, it's going to be critical going forward. Mm -hmm. That is... Uh, is it sort of Ukraine or bust for for Russia in in, in the Kremlin, mm. or has there been perhaps a degree of of learning mm -hmm. <laughs> where even if maybe it was this 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 naive or superficial sense of of, of fake Ukrainian identity, ha, you know, has the has Russia then learned now? that uh, there actually is a real Ukrainian identity, or at least they played a huge role now in really uh, uh, cementing that. And, and the reason why this is relevant is it will determine, A, if this war can ever end, and B, uh, because will the Russians accept it ending, ending or, or 
uh, or are we just going to potentially have a pause where Russia will keep, no matter what, no matter how much, how successful the Ukrainian counteroffensive is, as long as Putin is there, you know, eight years from now, we're going to have another, you know, round three of mm -hmm. this conflict. And mm -hmm. just as a, as a very, very brief footnote, a quote from Prigozhin, expletive, 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 we created a militarized Ukraine. <laughs> which is Exploted. again, you know, so expletive, 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 <laughs> yeah. which yeah. is an odd admission in a way, given mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the the basic lines of these yeah. arguments. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll, Jade, you start, mm -hmm. and we'll, I yeah. want Maria and Michael and. and I mean, in terms of the Ukraine or bust, ultimately, yes. In my interpretation, whilst Putin and um, his, I suppose, the more collective Putin in that sense, or at least the Slovaki, remain in power, I think that's I think that's where we are in terms of if there is a frozen conflict, it will just be seen as time to rearm, maybe, you know, I mean, you have the sort of angry patriots who want to kind of use it to mobilize Russian society. I'm very skeptical that it's possible to mobilize Russian society in that way. Um, but in any case, I also want to come back to a very quick point before I hand over to Maria, who I think will probably have more insightful answer. But this, this, this point is that they knew there was a Ukrainian identity. They just thought that having that Ukrainian identity made you a Nazi or a Banderovitz. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's really what denazification I think men as a shorthand, even though denazification itself is like this really horrible term, and so it didn't it didn't work out, and it was quietly dropped. But I think that's what it was supposed to represent was this idea of dis of of getting rid of those you know Ukrainians who had misunderstood or been brainwashed or were being held captive by these you know Western-backed fascists, and then they would realize you know that they were good Ukrainians, i.e. you know Russia's cheeky younger brother, you know sort of figuratively speaking. Mm -hmm. That okay, they have a soft turn, maybe they have a few odd words, but ultimately, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're Russian. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the explanations have surrounded around, wow, this, like, Banderite problem is a reference to a wartime nationalist, a fascist leader. Um, this Banderite problem is worse than we imagined. So mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's not, you know, it, it's still, the argument isn't, it can still function, but I'd like mm -hmm. to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to build exactly on it. They thought this, uh, quote, unquote, Nazi identity, right, was just a margin and they thought they can deal with it fairly easily. Uh, the, some of the articles by pro-Kremlin uh, journalists mm. that published right before the invasion are very telling. We just come, take care of this Nazi real fast, this is, here's how we do it. Remember they had the Ros, uh, Ros Guardia, the Ros mm -hmm. Guards with them to take care of those groups and we'll deal with this issue. I think actually slowly but steadily uh, they will learn to accept um, that uh, Ukrainians are and nation. I think, honestly, in some kind of uh, interesting way, it's already happening. And I trace that by looking as to how this is a very heroic and cool uh, Ukrainian small incursions into Russia, mm -hmm. uh, how they are perceived in Russia domestically. So when, for example, drones uh, were attacked the Kremlin, the most popular explanation of Russia was just, of course, Ukrainians wouldn't do anything like that. Mm -hmm. Probably it's a dismissive post-imperial uh, argument, right, because they just mm -hmm. can't. Uh, it's it's got to be the Kremlin's false flag. There's no other way. You can see it's staged. All these very elaborate theories emerged as to how this has been filmed. But now in Belgorodska uh, region, the response is very different. It's much harder now to argue that has been staged uh, by the Kremlin, even if there were some people trying to do that, but at the lower scale. So I actually see that at a slow but inevitable acceptance on the agency on Ukrainian side. I think it would only do good for um, Russians. And mm -hmm. of course, we also have to give credit to quote unquote uh, Putin's geopolitical geniuses that tends to create <laughs> a lot of um, self fulfilling kind of circle, a lot of things that he's scared of militarized and committed, consolidated Ukraine, NATO expanding to Russia's borders, and what not. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Two Michael, points. Final, final thoughts. Uh, you know, I think that. Looking at it from a vantage point of a U.S. policymaker, which is, uh, uh, and this is very much a book I hope would be read by as many U.S. or you know Western policymakers uh, as uh, as possible, I think what it does is is indicate the scale of the problem, which is going back to the title, not a Putin problem, mm -hmm. uh, but indeed uh, a Russia problem. It's not to stigmatize all mm -hmm. Russians or to to paint the country in an unnecessarily uh, dark light, but the book cannot be read without the reader realizing that this is a much greater set of issues than simply the agendas of Putin's Kremlin or even the, the Kremlin writ large. Uh, and, you know, that should introduce, I think, a very healthy sense of caution as to what the possible future scenarios yeah. are. None of us knows what those are. 
Optimism, I think, has an important place in policy making, uh, but it has to be measured mm -hmm. against perceived realities, and the perceived reality in this case is a pretty ominous one. That would be yeah. the first point. Second point is, from a policy perspective, I think you work with what you have. And so mm -hmm. I've been very struck by an idea from Lawrence Friedman uh, that what the West needs to do, what Ukraine, the West, its supporters outside of the West need to do, is instill in Russia, to the extent possible, a sense of futility, that the war mm -hmm. is futile. Mm -hmm. And that's a very difficult project. We don't have access to Russian media. We don't have much of a voice within Russia itself, so there are lots of limitations We there. have Maria's followers. So. <laughs> we yeah, have Maria's 10,000 10, uh, 10, <laughs> followers, uh, and, uh, uh, and that's only to the good. Uh, but you can sometimes speak uh, with your actions. Uh, and I think in some respects, you know, the kind of steady drumbeat of announcements of military aid to Ukraine, mm -hmm. which continue, you know, one week it's Germany, another week it's mm -hmm. France, another week it's, it's, it's the U.S. You know, I don't know how much that trickles <laughs> down to popular opinion in Russia, probably not much. But still, I think it builds and builds this notion of futility. Those incursions onto Russian territory, they're not going to change the course of the war in a strategic sense, but mm -hmm. that could build a sense of, oh, my yeah. God, look at the capacities that they have, and this is just not the war that we were expecting to fight. It's somehow coming to us or the Kremlin uh, drone strikes, if the New York Times is, is correct, and those were, uh, you know, sort of masterminded uh, in, in, in Kiev. But I think that there are other ways in which that narrative can be mm -hmm. just developed and instilled uh, over time. And so to that extent, it's not to say that the futility idea discounts anything that's in mm -hmm, your book mm -hmm. or discredits anything that's in your book. To the contrary, it's sort of there because the problem is so grave, mm -hmm. but I think it's the answer to the problem that's not just passivity or mm -hmm. that Russia will always be such or the, mm -hmm. the future is predetermined. So uh, I would balance those two points off of each other in my yeah. reading of the book. Maria has a quick comment. Just quick quickly comment. build on what there's a perfect way to, I think, balance this argument with Jade's argument. As long as the Russian society is seen as being acquiescent, right, mm -hmm. rallying behind any choice, uh, choices that the state makes, it's because they rely on the status quo that the state offers to them, right? Mm -hmm. Once they see that status quo is kind of uh, crumbling, uh, becoming less, uh, making less sense, mm -hmm. um, becoming more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I think it will be easier to break that consolidation uh, behind uh, the Kremlin. I completely agree, and I think um, the point really is that we are only likely to see an attitudinal shift, uh, such as we might hope to see, when events change. You know, when the actual sort of facts on the ground change, which is why, to me, I think that the only then sensible approach in terms of a policy approach is to support Ukraine because it's Ukraine that is making Arm the Ukraine. difference. Arm Ukraine, exactly, yeah. right? Um, because it's them who, it's they who will make the difference and it's, and of course with Western support, you know, ensure that this the futility of it does come to pass and, you know, different elements, I mean, like you're talking about in, in, in Belgorod as well, I mean, there is, there's already tension there, you know, about putting anti-aircraft, you know, uh, weapons on um, the, on um, residential buildings and things like this. So if you change the facts on the ground, that's going to start to change attitudes. And I think that's how we need to think about it rather than how do we change attitudes to change facts mm -hmm. on the ground, especially because it's really hard to change attitudes. We're, we're at time. But, Sorry. It, but it does strike me with, I mean, this may be one thing that the Russian, uh, Russian liberals would say. And I, I think this is where maybe the White House or the U.S. could could offer some path forward is is Russian liberals at least need to articulate an alternative future for Russia. And that seems sort of missing. I mean, obviously it's going to be missing right now in Putin's mm -hmm. Russia because it's an increasingly uh, authoritarian, if not totalitarian society. But that strikes me as the kind of the goal, the, the job of the expat exile liberal Russian is to offer an alternative vision and a mm -hmm. sense of hope and optimism, even if we're, we're quite pessimistic. Uh, I, I'm not sure if, uh, uh, if that will be fruitful, but Jade, I want to congratulate you on a phenomenal book, um, Russia's War. It'll be out Tuesday uh, in bookstores here in the United States. It's already available uh, in the UK. And what I also want to say is all those that are watching, I want you to grab your phone, Go to your, wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to Russian Roulette, uh, <laughs> as well as our sister podcast, The Eurofile, because if you're watching this, then you will love those podcasts as well, and they bring a lot of informed uh, content. But I want to thank you uh, all here, thank Michael, you. Maria, Jade, for, for joining in studio, uh, and I want to thank you so much for, for tuning in online. It's been, been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.